The second generation in Davis Bottom saw technological changes their parents could have only imagined. Automobiles, airplanes, movies, and radio transformed American life at the turn of the century. The popularity of a new cash crop, white burly tobacco, transformed Lexington's economy. By 1910, Lexington had the world's largest tobacco market. The growth in jobs at tobacco redryers, stemmers, and warehouses began to change the demographics of Davis Bottom. Unlike other postbellum African American urban clusters, it started out very segregated, but over time, it actually became more equal in terms of percentage of African Americans to whites. In 1900, I think there were about 62% African American, and in 1930, there were a little over half. So there is a shift, and actually, as you continue into the mid to late 20th century, you see continued increase of whites living there because of the migration of Eastern Kentucky families into the area, which dramatically changed the demographics of the neighborhood. Over the past 10 years, scholars have been compiling records on nearly every home and building in Davis Bottom. Using field surveys and archival research, the scholars are documenting the neighborhood's historic architecture, including the most common style of home, the shotgun house. This rectangular house form can be found in most of Kentucky's urban communities. Shotgun houses are typically one room wide, two or three rooms deep, and one story high. They fit into narrow lots, which allows for the construction of more homes along urban streets. I think it's important to document the structures of working class communities, because even though they may not seem to be architecturally ornate or grand structures, they reveal a great deal about the people who lived in those communities who were so important to the industries that surrounded them and had their own stories to tell that a lot of times are forgotten about. When we grew up, we were in a one, two, three room house. The living room, a middle room, and a kitchen. We didn't have inside running water. We had an outhouse. We only had one bedroom. My mom, my dad, we'd maybe have a little cot or some would sleep on pallets. You know, my mom would take blankets and make us a pallet and that's how we slept. We always managed. The population of Davis Bottom peaked at about 1,050 residents between 1910 and 1920. During this time, public schools began to play a vital role in the lives of residents. Schools were segregated. Black students attended Patterson Street School, which was built in 1896 with funds raised by Pleasant Green Church. The two-story school, located just 20 feet from rail tracks, shook whenever a freight train passed. Patterson was demolished when George Washington Carver Elementary School was built in 1934. Constructed by the Works Progress Administration, Carver served thousands of neighborhood students until it was closed in 1972. Today, the building holds the Carver Community Center, Fanny Hathaway White, Isaac Hathaway's sister, worked as a teacher and principal at both Patterson and Carver during her long distinguished career in education. White students attended Abraham Lincoln Elementary School, located just beyond the viaduct in Irishtown. Opened in 1912, Lincoln had exemplary programs and facilities. Vocational training, an open air roof, lunch programs, a Montessori kindergarten, and evening classes for adults. Lincoln was demolished in the 1970s, but residents recall that during tough economic times, the school was a lifeline. It was a good school. They gave out to needy kids. I mean, the whole school gave lunch. No child or nobody had to pay for any lunch. And you know, and all of us down here, you know, their parents couldn't afford to pay for nothing like that because they barely could make it, you know. But nobody went hungry. One of the most important institutions in Davis Bottom is the Nathaniel United Methodist Mission. Born during the Great Depression, Nathaniel Mission has served local residents and the homeless for over 80 years. 
Well, it is our understanding that Nathaniel Mission was founded either in the late 20s or, or in the mid 30s as a group of Asbury Seminary students came up from Wilmore every Sunday morning honking their horns to get people out to worship on the hillside by the abandoned railroad track now. It was primarily founded as a spiritual endeavor. At some point, First United Methodist Church in Lexington kind of took it over. We moved into a building and it became a spiritual worship center as well as providing for physical needs as clothing and food for the residents in Davis Bottom, which were truly, truly on the margins with no safety net. Nathaniel Mission served not only the residents of Davis Bottom, but also a large number of homeless men, women, and children who camped in the woods near the train tracks. In 1946, the mission moved into its present building, where it continues to provide spiritual, educational, and medical services. In the clinic, we'll have a combined patient visit of last year of about 2,200 patient visits, and that's dentistry, vision, and medical. It includes our diabetes education classes also. On the mission church side of it, including worship services, our feeding programs is not limited just to folks without homes. We had 12,000 visits on the mission side of it last year. Davis Bottom is known as a railroad town. Over the generations, numerous residents have worked as crew, laborers, freight handlers, cooks, and porters. The Cincinnati Southern Railroad had two facilities around Davis Bottom. Built in 1908, a large passenger station served the famous Queen and Crescent route, which ran from Cincinnati to New Orleans. The Cincinnati Southern also had a freight operation off Broadway. Built in 1881, this ornate wooden freight depot handled the railroad's commercial cargo. In the 1920s, the wooden structure was replaced by a large concrete building to better serve the tobacco trade. The second freight depot was a reinforced concrete structure built in 1925 and very minimalist Art Deco style. The surface was concrete and it had small chevron decorations, but other than that, it was very plain, two-story structure. It would have been a place of employment for many of the residents. It was also located amongst the tobacco warehouses and factories where we know that many of the residents were employed. The Cincinnati Southern Freight Depot closed in 1956. The building served as a warehouse until destroyed by a fire in 2007. The Cincinnati Southern Freight Depot was significant more recently as Lexington's last remaining piece of railroad history. Looking at the photos that we have of the building, especially in its later years, it doesn't appear to be the most architecturally significant building, but its role in the neighborhood and within the larger rail system was very vital. And its role in the history of the railroad in Lexington is something that needs to be remembered. When the circus came to town, they unloaded there. They would come in, you know, late at night and unload and parade up to Red Mile. It wasn't an official parade, it was a working parade. The elephants were pulling wagons and so forth, and they would set up the big top, and we kids would help with all that and get free passes to the circus. They would come in that night, and by 1 o'clock the next day, they were up and going. So, of course, the whole neighborhood uh, would be out at midnight to watch the circus come in. Flooding and construction impacted most of the archaeological sites in Davis Bottom. But in the winter of 2010, Dr. Faberson discovered intact privies behind two shotgun homes built on DeRode Street in the 1920s. Archaeologists found a wood-lined privy behind one lot. A week later, the team uncovered another privy lined with slate salvaged from old pool tables. We had approximately 38,000 artifacts that were recovered during the entire project from areas three and five. And roughly 20,000 of those artifacts came just from the privies. The materials recovered from Davis Bottom were taken to cultural resource analysts in Lexington. Here, staff members carefully washed, cataloged, and researched the entire collection. 
I think the most intriguing thing to me was just the large variety of artifacts that came from the privies with such wide date ranges. It is really, really typical to find a site, especially a site that's had a really long period of use, to find artifacts from an early period all the way until a late period. But for these particular privies, we were finding artifacts that could have been manufactured as early as 1880, and then artifacts that were dated to 2006. It just really suggests that the people that were living there were probably salvaging items and using them over a long period of time. What I at least see from a professional perspective is looking at a combination of the archival evidence with the archaeological evidence is that in spite of the challenges these people were facing, we do see some common factors. We see them doing things like picking raspberries and strawberries and they're probably growing tomatoes and they're canning them and they're having fish fries and they're doing things that to me at least, and although we don't have a lot of evidence, to me at least establishes what I've read in newspaper articles, et cetera, that says this was still a tight-knit community. There was still a lot of cohesion there in spite of everything. They stuck together. In the year 1900, Isaac Hathaway returned to Davis Bottom. Isaac and his father, Robert, set up an art studio in the chicken coop behind their house on West Pine Street. If anybody knows anything about a chicken coop, it's not a place I set up as a studio, but that's what was available to him. So he and his father probably cleaned out the chicken coop and put a new roof on it, put siding on it to protect it from the weather, and that's where he worked. Hathaway secured commissions from a variety of patrons and institutions. He cast a series of life and death masks and created plaster models for Transylvania University and the Smithsonian Institution. His artistic skill made national news when he reconstructed the tree from a crime scene for a court case. He was accused of having mutilated the death scene and when the opposing attorney went to prove that he had mutilated the death scene, he stabbed the tree trunk with a knife, and when he pulled it out, it was plaster Paris. So not only had he created the scene just as he was supposed to, but he had colorized it enough that he convinced everybody, or made them believe, that it was the actual scene. In 1907, Isaac Hathaway moved to Washington, D.C. He established the Afro Art Company, earning commissions from numerous federal agencies and museums. Hathaway also began creating his signature work. Fulfilling his childhood promise, Hathaway cast a series of busts depicting African-American leaders, such as Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, Bishop Richard Allen, and poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar. The 12-inch busts sold for a dollar. Hathaway even provided an installment plan. You have to understand, time was very difficult for most people. They didn't have money to waste buying a statue or buying a work of art and to make these affordable. And, and they were well-crafted. And for people to own something, even though it was plaster, they were painted with bronze color and it made it to look like real bronze. And it made people feel like they owned something but it also gave them a chance to look at someone that they idolized. Isaac Hathaway made another big career change in 1915. He left Washington, D.C. to establish the ceramics program at Branch Normal College, which is now the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Isaac Hathaway was not only concerned about developing his own skills, but also furthering the information and knowledge among other blacks. And he found that college and university was a proving ground for a lot of the information and research he had done in sculpture and ceramics. Hathaway continued to teach, experiment with clays, and create his own artwork. He became known as the Dean of Negro Ceramicists for establishing numerous programs at Southern colleges. During his long career, the U.S. Mint commissioned Hathaway to design two commemorative coins. In 1946, he created the Booker T. Washington Half Dollar, the first U.S. coin to depict an African American. In 1951, 
Hathaway designed a second half dollar with profiles of both Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver. Hathaway and Carver became close friends when they both taught at the Tuskegee Institute. He inspired his students to understand they can be whatever they want to be. And during the 30s and 40s, he's a black man trying to make a living, a carve out a living as an artist. But he set by example that you can make a living even in the arts. In 1940, a WPA photographer took this rare photograph of the shotgun homes along DeRode Street. That same year, Van Deren Koch took two more photographs of Davis Bottom. These three rare images captured Davis Bottom at an historical crossroad. The Great Depression would soon end with America's entry into World War II. Lexington's economy grew with wartime industries, but the population of Davis Bottom steadily declined. The neighborhood was zoned for industrial use. Hundreds of homes were demolished for factories and warehouses. Yet many residents hold positive memories from this time period. They remember Davis Bottom as a tight-knit community where the word neighbor meant everything. <laughs>